relationship with, with Italy as well as Japan. And then it's all about um, our responsibilities as a P5 nation. It's about our own national interest with a phenomenal economic drive and the level of world GDP from that part of the region. It's acknowledging that the world is changing and that the, the geography of the world uh, in the high north is changing. And, and the notion that in the next 20 years, a container traveling from Japan to Rotterdam might take half the time that it currently does is, is, going, to, is, is going to adjust that. And then I also think it's this notion, and Jens Stoltenberg talked about this, that the notion that problems are regional or big, big issues are regional is slightly flawed. That, that we, we, live in, we live in a world and we're beneficiaries of a world where the, the whole world is, is, is interacting. But it means that the security issues tend to be global ones rather than narrow uh, regional ones. And therefore, we've got, we've, we've, we've got a shared, shared role and interest. And it links to my first point, which is the Europe continues to be an extraordinary beneficiary of US investment in Europe. And it follows to me that a United States that is increasingly concerned about the Indo-Pacific, it looks for partners to share in, in those concerns and to contribute. And, and, and all of this is, is joined together. So that's the, the, the Indo-Pacific. If I then come back to uh, Europe, <clears throat> that really is the frame for what's going on with Ukraine. It's about, it's, it's more than this, 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 this um, quite narrowly defined piece of territory. And I don't mean that in, in any way to, 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 to underestimate the the struggle that Ukraine is under to get its sovereign territory back and the lives that it's costing. But in a bigger sense, this is about the Euro-Atlantic security and it's also about the clarity of a rules-based international system and that when you have that flagrant abuse that Russia uh, has, um, has been, a, 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 yeah, has been the, the provider of that example and its illegal invasion into Ukraine, that, again, impacts on all of us, and, and that's why we have to respond, and we were, we're supporting Ukraine in the way that we are. And, and I continue to be of the view that this, is, this has been a catastrophic failure for Russia. Um, Russia is not achieving its objectives, which was to subjugate Ukraine and to bring Ukraine under the, the yoke of Russia. And it's actually, if it was all about trying to trying to bring Ukraine further to the east and under, Ukraine, under Russia's control, it's the, it's the actual reverse that has happened. And if you look at the polling data for Ukraine, the population has got even stronger resolve that its future is to the west and its longer-term future is alongside its, its, its European partners. Uh, and it's looking to both be part of the economic and the social and the political structure of the EU, and it's trying to be part of the, the security structure under NATO. And, and that, is, that directional change is nev it's never going to go back to the east, and that is where Russia has failed. And then Russia's failure is compounded by NATO getting stronger and the, and, and, and the joining of Finland and Sweden, the economic pressure that Russia is under, uh, the diplomatic pressure that Russia is under, and then if you come back to the security space, Russia has lost you know, over 270,000 people either killed and wounded, over, you know, over 2,000 tanks, arguably over, over 4,000 armoured fighting vehicles. Its combat eff effectiveness of its land forces has been reduced by 50%. And, and this, my worry is that we're focusing too much on tactical progress um, when actually Ukraine continues to have the initiative. Ukraine has regained 50% of the land that Russia initially took back in February last year. Ukraine is the one that is pushing forward. Ukraine is adapting to the really difficult circumstances that it faces with some uh, extraordinarily tough Russian defences. And we need to continue our support in the way that we've done. And that was shaped last year but it's been manifest this year with those commitments of equipment and training 
to grow the combat power for Ukraine to allow them to then start their counteroffensive. And we can go into more detail as to, as to what might emerge over the, over, over the next few months and some transitions that Ukraine has to take. But I'm, 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 I'm wary that the tactical conversation about how many hundreds of meters has Ukraine achieved today is becoming the notion of victory when this is a war that Russia has lost and this is a war that Ukraine is winning. And it's winning because it's got a future uh, ahead for a, for, a, for a nation where it's going to be thriving in, with democracy and a prosperity and a security uh, framework that is going to be shaped by its relationship with the West. So that, and then the, I'll, probably I'll stop there rather than, because uh, I ramble on. Uh, I'll stop there and, uh, and use that as an opening pitch. Wonderful. Uh, so so let, let's start with Ukraine and Russia. There's a, um, uh, Ukraine is in the middle of a counteroffensive, and um, you brought up a great point about how it seems like a lot of the focus is on tactical successes rather than kind of zooming out and looking at the larger geopolitical implications of this. And it seems to me like ally countries are still... Um, having a different idea about how best to help Ukraine. And it's sort of fundamentally, from my perspective, I want to hear what you think, um, a disagreement and assessment of how much of a threat Russia poses to the entire um, uh, alliance sort of beyond Ukraine. In other words, if, you know, if, they just, if we can just hold them here, degrade the Russian military, you know, then, then we'll be okay. Whereas some say, especially our Eastern European allies, Central European allies say, no, you know, Ukraine needs to truly prevail, needs to push the Russians back, and, and therefore they need these certain kinds of weapons, certain kinds of categories of weapons. So can you talk to us about what kind of pressing threat does Russia still pose, not just to Ukraine, but to European security generally, mm. um, to the UK, NATO, yes. and why you think it's so important that we understand that particular piece so we can get a strategy that fits. Yes, so thank you. So I think it's, it's, I think it's incredibly important at the higher level uh, that we maintain the clarity that when you, when you invade another country and when you impose that level of violence against civilians and when you attack the, uh, the, 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 the national infrastructure... Um, if you look at the Black Sea, 26 ports and um, port facilities either damaged or destroyed in the last few months. That, that, that is getting right at the heart of, of, of how, a na how a nation looks to exist. And I think we, the clarity of um, the Western world, if we, if, if we use that as a lazy phrase, the clarity of, of responding and supporting Ukraine in that struggle uh, is... is is essential, and we maintain that. And I think the political, um, you know, the, the last G7 at uh, Hiroshima, uh, you, you had time, uh, the, the, um, the Munich Security Conference, mm -hmm. you, every time you have political leaders who I think are extraordinarily clear, and they're clear that they're going to see this through all the way through. When you then come down another level, we, in our integrated review, both in 2021 and in 2023, declared Russia as an acute threat. And I think that is manifest because the threat is that Russia is using violence for political ends and it uses its military instrument in a way that not very many nations on the planet turn to, turn to violence. And they, the backdrop is ensuring that Russia is seen to fail and that when it breaks the international rules, and then when it uses violence, the world sees that this is a, a bankrupt approach. And it's also in a physical security, acknowledging that Russia still has very credible forces in space, in cyber, in nuclear, particularly its underwater program, and in its long-range um, bombers and missiles. And, and so that's why I think those, those countries that border on on Russia, say that this is they, they feel this, but I think it's why you're seeing NATO and NATO on a path to be even stronger in order to be able to deter Russia, because the other backdrop is that a conventional war with Russia, that actually the one area where Russia has parity 
with NATO, or the area where it has closest parity with NATO, is in the nuclear sphere. And so the, the notion of deterrence and ensuring that Russia sees that the military instrument as a mechanism to achieve its political aims is bereft is crucial to maintain our security. And I come back to you. And then I also think that they, those, those, those lessons are ones for the whole world to take so that if your country X and you're contemplating using your military in order to achieve your political ends in this way and to, to, to use violence, then again you see that this is both a risky strategy and it's a flawed strategy. So you, you brought up the, the D word, deterrence. <laughs> um, and my assessment has been that, um, that, that the United States and our, and our NATO uh, partners, mm-hmm. allies, failed to deter Russian aggression, sort of small D deterrence as it invaded uh, Ukraine in this full-scale invasion in 2022. And so now we are engaged, not not we, but the Ukrainians, but we're providing support in this intra-war deterrence to try to reestablish peace on terms that favor Ukraine Mm. and and, and NATO. And on that point, um, the UK has been really... uh, pressing even further than the United States has with longer-range strike systems, even before the United States in 2022, before we delivered HIMARS. Y'all were, are, were pressing. I think you, you even delivered them the, um, the storm yeah. shadow. Yeah. The cre- so talk, talk to us a little bit about, because I think sometimes we can get almost um, overly risk-averse in thinking that if we enable Ukraine to do too well, to, to have too much success, that, that then Russia will escalate further. But the alternative, of course, is that this is just a long, protracted war in which um, the good guys don't win. Um, so talk, talk to me about that, that concept of intra-war deterrence enabling Ukraine to truly have some successful military victories. Yes. So, on that, so, so the good guys are winning and the bad guys are losing. Um, whether, whether it takes time for that realization to sink in and to become clear... I think is one of those dilemmas of, uh, of, 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 of combat and conflict. But I don't... I think that the, the, um, Mark Milley and I, I think it would be very similar on, on, on the langu- language that we've used. That, so when, when sometimes people sort of say, well, why can't you just, um, just go in super heavy and, uh, and, and, and just mean that um, you, you, you provide them far more and, and, and allow, the, allow, allow a much swifter victory and so on. I think it misses that, that what is actually going on is, is, is a balance for support to Ukraine, impose a cost on Russia, maintain international unity, and, and avoid escalation. And, and I think America... Uh, has been magnificent at, at at managing those parameters because it is utterly crucial that we continue with the international unity that, that we see. It's crucial that we manage the, the escalation risks while sticking to those mantras of supporting Ukraine and imposing the cost on Russia. And, and, and I can understand the frustration at times... Um, but that's why, you, the, the, yeah, I think the senior leaders have been constantly attenuating th- those parameters. And I think, I think America, I think we all have that responsibility, but America ha- bears that responsibility even more strongly than the rest of us, because if it was to escalate, um, if, w- if, if it was to fracture some of the international unity, then the country that then has to help pick up the pieces in a much stronger way than any other is the United States of America. And, and, and so that's what's going on. Um, and that's why you can't just have this, right, we're going to pile in over here and so on. You're, it, it, it's a much more um, sensitive approach. And that might be, and, and, you know, that, at times, that, that understandably is frustrating for Ukraine, but it's, it's the broader responsibilities that we all hold. Um, thank you for that. Um, yeah, it, and, and I think the UK has played a role in sort of pushing the alliance to, to do more, at least from my perspective, uh, longer range strike systems and that, and that kind of thing, because not, not every member of the alliance is playing the same role in all of this, especially you know, as it, in, in terms of coming up with a coalition to help Ukraine. So, yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm proud of the way the UK has, has, has sought to, to, to have that you know, 
play its part in, 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 in the leadership role, amongst others. But that meant you know, the, the provision of, of, of lethal aid, so the, the NLAW's um, anti-tank system very early on. Um, then some of the, the, the long-range artillery, GMLRS. Um, then, as you say, we sort of step into, in, in, into storm shadow. Um, I think that's right. The provision, we were the first to provide uh, a main battle tank, or mm -hmm. say that we we're going to. But I don't want to, I don't want to over egg. Yeah, this this is this is a team approach, and the other major European nations, France and Germany, um, have been you know, extraordinarily uh, strong supporters. Other nations have provided uh, money. Others have provided non-lethal aid, and I I talk about some of the you know, when Lloyd Austin holds the Ukraine defence contact groups. That's, that's 50 nations, over 50 nations in a room, and maybe a dozen other nations um, on the screen. That, and that once again, sort of augurs political uh, statements uh, demonstrating resolve, as well as uh, hard cash, as well as ammunition, as well as equipment. And that, 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 that needs to be celebrated in terms of how, and it must be terrifying if you're Russia. And if you're, if you're Russia and you, your, your, your way to try and manage this is to continue to cozy up to the likes of Iran and North Korea, that, that, that's desperate. That, that's the piece that I'm, I'm taking. This, this, this is a desperate position that Russia is in because of a catastrophic mistake that it's made. Let, let's, let's, um, we started off by talking about how we're trying to tilt to this, the, the big threat, which is China, but you, we've just been spent spending all the time talking about Russia. And of course, they're related, from my perspective. Um, and that Russia has actually gotten quite a bit of, of diplomatic cover from the Chinese, um, component parts, maybe not directly in terms of weapons, directly to, to Russia's effort in Ukraine. Um, but, but certainly China has not been helpful um, to, to us. And, um, and then now you see this collaboration. You've got Russia, North Korea, Iran um, with the Chinese. So let's talk about how you perceive the China military threat and how it relates to the Russia problem. So I, th this is where there is a distinction between a US policy position and a UK policy position. So we describe Russia as an acute threat. We don't use that language for China. We acknowledge China as a systemic competitor, and so there is a difference there. I think, again, in terms of Russia, Ukraine, and China, yes, China has been supportive of Russia, but in a very limited way. And I think we should be cautious about the notion of Russia and China becoming super close, and some of the language of their, their leaders last year. Because my, my experience of partnership and working with other nations, and especially in the military and security domain, is that your, your cultural links, your histories, the way that you see the world, um, the political masters that you serve, those are so fundamental for you then to be able to take action together. And I think the mismatch in the relationship between China and Russia um, means that that is, as well as the that the difference in their cultural backgrounds means that, that 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 is very, very hard for those two to forge a relationship. And then I also think we've got to acknowledge that there have been times where China has been responsible. It's, been, it's, it's, got, it's got a limited uh, approach to Russia and hasn't been uh, arming Russia in the way that Russia uh, has sought. Last autumn, uh, I would just say a last fall uh, for this audience. Uh, when Russia was using incredibly reckless nuclear rhetoric and the world was right to be concerned, I think America, some of the European states, but actually other countries such as India, Saudi Arabia, and especially China, of making it clear to Russia that this cannot stray into any notion of, of a nuclear conflict. I think that was uh, deeply responsible. And I think it adds to the problems for Russia that it doesn't want a nuclear war and it doesn't want a war with NATO. And, and yes, it can look for other partners. And then, then I also think the other element for this is when, 
if you're the, the Chinese leadership and you are discussing with your military um, you have various plans as to you know, um, whether it's contingencies or aspirations as to where you might use your military for some of your political ends and ambitions. I think one of the big lessons uh, of uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is be really wary about military that say you can invade a country and guess what, it'll be quite straightforward and in, in, in weeks or months this is where we will get to. Um, now I think that's a truism anyway, but I think the, the, the fact it's so manifest to China um, I think is an enormous caution. And then this is, this is, this is, this is a Russia-Ukraine that, that share a land border, never mind when you have some of the more difficult tactical uh, aspects that, 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 that might be in the China frame. And then the other big lessons uh, for, for, for me in terms of Ukraine is the importance of collective security and, and what that then uh, provides. The notion that when a country is fighting for its territory and what you trigger is this extraordinary resolve and extraordinary desire for self-determination, which, which, which is really hard to calculate. Um, so you can do all your orbat, and you can add up all the equipment, and you can add up the number of people, but it's really, really hard to to put to accurately portray the the, the resolve of a nation, and, and 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 then and then there's the nuclear piece of 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 actually nuclear states becoming involved in conflict is 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 is, is deeply dangerous and is one to be to be guarded against. So then let's talk about the China military threat to Taiwan. Um, you can talk. You can ha you can decide kind of how you want to approach to answer this question. But then, do you think that some of the lessons of how NATO has responded, and not just NATO, our our, our allies in the Pacific, uh, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the tai Taiwan, even um, has supported NATO and supported Ukraine's um, desire yes. to to prevail? Do you think then that some of these the, the way this has carried out um, has been helpful? in um, steering the Chinese away from thinking that, that they might gain something politically, militarily by moving on Taiwan? Or has that helped move the window towards our favor? So, that, that, so that, that's the one sort of piece of the question. And then the other piece of the question, though, is, I mean, AUKUS. AUKUS's you know, pr primary purpose is to, to work between our, our countries and, and the Australians to really um, lean on one another in a hard power way tech transfer, cooperation, and to move fast um, because we are concerned that we're not in a good spot in deterring Chinese aggression. And so I want to talk about Pillar 2 um, in particular because there's an opportunity yeah. here, I think, to be doing some things to steer the Chinese to, to consider that this is not a wise path to go down towards. Um, yes, so, so, so thanks. So I don't think it's a deep, um, it's a kind of particularly uh, deep insight that one of the conclusions that China may have taken from um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is, is, is a wariness about the use of the military instrument in that way. So that, you know, I think that's, like I said, that it's, it's almost in the bleeding obvious camp. Um, I think the, 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 your other points about, I think the other, the other points are, in a less tactical way, are even more significant. The way that the world has come together to support the rules-based international system, so whether it's uh, the imposition of sanctions, whether it's the imposition of, of diplomatic measures, and we can always argue, well, they could have been stronger, and you know, Russia is able to, to wheedle out of some of these things and so on. But the overall impact, uh, is, I think, is really significant. And then I think it's even more than AUKUS. Um, I, see, I see the the visit by President Modi to Washington, and and that the forging of a strategic relationship there between between America and uh, India, the relationship between um, America and Australia, the continued strength of the relationship um, with Japan, the investment that all these nations are making in their militaries. Um, this is an extraordinary <coughs> response. The, the, the European powers all having strategies for the Indo-Pacific, the major European powers all having strategies for the Indo-Pacific, all doing more in the Indo-Pacific. That, that, that again is why we've got to be careful that, that the events lead to other triggers and other responses. And when you list what's happening 
I think it's becoming much more constraining on China. And I, I accompanied our previous Defence Secretary, uh, Ben Wallace, to uh, a, a bunch of countries in the Indo-Pacific. And one of them, and again, it's, it's these fundamental principles. Vietnam, Vietnam wants to be able to use the South China Seas because that's where it gets 80% of its protein to feed its population. It's, it's not a great power battle that it wants to have with China. It just wants to feed its population. And it wants responsible P5 nations to play their role in, in, in pushing back on, on, on China and, so are we um, doing and, stating, and stating that well, this is unacceptable and there are consequences to your behavior. And, and you know, if, <laughs> are we doing enough? Well, I think what you're seeing is that that dial is coming back. And then I, the other piece that I think we have to be careful with the language is, and, and, and again, I think it's where there's a slight distinction sometimes between, between the way that this is portrayed in America and the way that it's portrayed in, in, in Europe, is I think the, the bigger piece here is to deter you know, violence and instability in the Indo-Pacific. Rather, and it definitely isn't to get into the trap of preparing for instability and violence. I, I, I think we're really clear that the, these are opportunities to deter instability and to maintain the security that, that already exists. Wonderful. I do want to get to questions from the audience, um, so you can be thinking about that. Um, and you, you made wonderful points about the use of Russia's um, very dangerous use of nuclear threats um, as kind of this, this, this cloud that looms over the entire conflict um, to try to deter uh, NATO allies from contributing too much um, to, to Ukraine. And, um, and of course, um, our countries are very close um, um, allies in, in strong nuclear deterrent. So can, can you just, I'm not going to ask you to answer sort of any political questions, but regardless of what happens internally with your domestic politics, that the commitment to, to strategic deterrence is still there, it's, it's relevant, and it's especially relevant for the preservation of peace as we move into this uh, uh, very sort of uncertain and dynamic threat environment into the future. Yes. So I think it's, again, it's one of, to me, it's, it's even clearer than it was before. And, 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 and just on your language, I don't think, I don't think the nuclear cloud hangs over the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I actually would be more optimistic that that cloud has been pushed away. Hmm. Um, but, but that cloud is there. Yeah, but I, I, I think that, that, was the, that, that was the response of the world um, last autumn. For the UK, I think this has affirmed that t t two fundamental policies for our security construct, that we're a member of NATO and we want to be an active uh, and uh, important player of NATO, so our, our ambition and the reality that we are the, the, the leading European power within NATO, that, 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 that's our position. And, and that we, we maintain a nuclear deterrent and we have uh, a continuous at sea <coughs> nuclear deterrent. And that, that survives. Yeah, that, and yeah, the clarity again, we had, unusually for the UK, but, and uh, for me it was, it was, it's a privilege to serve, under three different prime ministers last year. We've just had a change of defence secretary. Well, but, but nothing changes. Um, so, 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 so again, we should take confidence in that. Questions? Bill? Uh, well, thank you very much for your remarks and appreciate the uh, great work the UK has done in this uh, conflict. Uh, I uh, do some work with the Department of Defense on the industrial base and one of the uh, defense industrial base and one of the uh, uh, stresses that this uh, Ukraine conflict has exposed is that uh, uh, the industrial base really is not up to the task at this point. Uh, and uh, up, uh, for the past uh, uh, decade or more, there's been a preoccupation with 2% uh, two, two investment mm. in, in defense. I wonder if, if uh, the alliance, it might be constructive for the alliance to revisit the, the NATO notion that readiness is a sovereign decision and that there's mm. no um, alliance-wide standard on, on readiness so that we could shift the uh, the focus from inputs to outputs so that we, we can have more confidence in the ability of the industrial base to meet the 
needs of the armed forces and the alliance. So, so thank you. Well, uh, so I think we're doing that, but I think we've got a lot more to do. So if I look at the journey of, of NATO and the, 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 the defense and deterrence uh, of the Atlantic policy, if I go back to Cardiff, uh, where that declaration of a minimum of 2%, then Vilnius and, and the, the, the affirmation that that, that that has to be a minimum and countries must show their pathway to 2%. But the other piece of Vilnius, to me, that was really uh, important was... Uh, and again, I, I pay tribute to, uh, to, to General Chris Cavoli's leadership, but also uh, his, his predecessor, Todd Walters, of, of the development of regional plans, which speaks exactly to what you're saying, of, of things that are um, much more concrete in terms of what it is that you uh, have agreed to provide, and that it is wrapped up not just with um, a figure on a table or whatever, that you've got the support uh, whether, it's the, uh, whether it's the ammunition, whether it's the enablers um, in terms of logistics, medic, medics, um, uh, communications that back that up. Um, so I think, I think that is much, much stronger than it was even a couple of years ago. And then your other point about the industrial base, I think we are all learning um, that we have to invest more in our industrial base because those notions of, of being able to sort of call off just in time well, actually, we've taken too much risk. And I'm not saying that we have to have Russian inventories. Um, if Russia used 10 million shells uh, last year, I don't think that we need 10 million shells because I think the way that we fight, we would like to see that 9 million of those shells would never even make it to the battlefield. But we have to have deeper stockpiles and we have to uh, invest so that we can have those deeper stockpiles, but also we can respond more quickly when conflict emerges. And you're seeing that, you're seeing that in, in, in America uh, and the, the investment, particularly for 155 shells, and how that comes to, to fruition next year. You're seeing it in the UK, and we're on a similar journey, uh, and that, that goes all the way through the decade. So not this one or two year thing. It's got to go through all the way through the decade so that industry can, can invest properly. And you're seeing it in the EU with a billion euros going into uh, artillery shell manufacture again to do it. So, so you're seeing those responses. I'm going to bundle the next two questions. Yeah, sorry. I, I, my, 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 I'll make my answer shorter as well. So I'll Pete and help Michonne. you out, Rebecca. OK, go ahead. Peter? Hi, thanks very much. Peter Martin from Bloomberg News. Um, looking ahead to the 2024 election here, I won't ask you to comment on domestic politics, <coughs> but from a military perspective, how long do you think Ukraine could keep fighting in the event of a precipitous drop-off in US aid? Hmm. There's one to think about, and then Sean. Yeah. The internet won't hear this, but that might not be a bad thing. Um, <laughs> Admiral, good morning. Thank you for your remarks today. Uh, those of us that follow... Thank you very much. Those of us that follow UK defence strategy closely, and that those people do exist, uh, <laughs> will have noticed the kind of prominence in the recent Defence <coughs> Command paper of uh, the idea of campaigning, which had its own chapter. Yes. You just talk about it, what is that in, in a world of great power competition? What, what will the UK be doing differently under this campaigning approach? And, and how does it relate to the US version of campaigning, <coughs> also prominent in the national defence? Yes. So um, if I can try and be quick, more quick uh, with my answer. So campaigning is really an acknowledgement that um, there was a risk that the way that we were using our, our, our military instrument was sometimes doing the same thing that we've always done or sometimes focused a bit too much on activity and not on outcomes and was too focused in the short term rather than the long term. And so it, at its heart, it's about trying to take a, a much longer approach in a temporal sense and a much broader approach in terms of what you're trying to achieve. And that might be, so, yeah, so, so, so rather like the US, we're, we're, we're beneficiaries of providing military education to, 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 to yeah, hundred, yeah, over 100 other nations. And that, that helps with your security because of the partnerships and relationships that go with it, as well as some of the equipment and some of the, you know, some, some of the, the, the more traditional elements. And it also links with your partnerships uh, and your alliances. And I, again, I would stress the AUKUS and and GCAP, they're, they're, they're strategic anchors for, for the next 50 years. And, and the security benefit that we get from that is extraordinary. So, and, and it's putting these things into a campaign mindset. 
on the on 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 the on the fight and uh, I, I I'm going to keep well away from uh, from 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 U.S. Uh, domestic politics, but on the on on the on this notion of uh, w w will will that then you know, will will this come to an end and does it conflicts morph? You're seeing Ukraine adapt to some uh, very credible Russian defensive tactics and. And Ukraine has uh, adapted and is taking a much more of a grind-through process, focused predominantly in the south, and it's, it's, it's holding at risk um, large amounts of, of Russian forces, particularly in, 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 in the center and, uh, and, and in the northeast. And, and, it, and it's adapted. Ukraine will adapt because the, 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 the resolve of the nation remains the same. And you, 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 we've seen this in recent conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. The, the, you, holding territory uh, is, is really difficult for militaries, and you get into other ways of contesting that. So whether that is you know, the classic resistance movements and so on. At the moment, you're seeing a much more traditional fight. But I, 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 I'm, I'm very wary of predictions that say, well, well, that then means that this comes to an end, or this, that, and the other. Or this, I actually think that, the again, I come back to that resolve of a nation to fight and to eject a, a, an occupier is extraordinary, and that's what you're seeing in Ukraine. And, and, and that, that once, once you've triggered that, well, actually, that goes on for a long time, and those people are incredibly, uh, yeah, yeah, ex display incredible ingenuity to achieve their aims, and, 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 and conflicts morph and twist and adjust. Question here? And then we'll take... I think right here, we'll we'll go right here, and then we'll just this last one, and then you'll have to forgive me for the, everybody else here. I know we could keep going for it, but in the interest of time, we'll wrap it up after this one uh, last question. Thank you so much, uh, um, Major General Huber, and the Austrian Defense Attaché. Two short questions. Assuming that uh, uh, Ukrainian friends would be able to regain their territory, do you think that would change the strategic uh, goal of uh, Russia? Uh, and the second one is, um, we haven't been speaking about Africa, mm. but um, I think what would be interesting, what is your view on Africa? And this, as my assumption is that it looks that the uh, European or Western nation are in the moment not so successful, whereas there's still a kind of success from, from Russia and also I think some, at least some economic uh, success from China. Thank you. Thank you. So on... So this, I, I, I don't know if the strategic goal will, will continue to exist, but the ability of Russia to achieve its strategic goal will be even less likely. Um, and I think they've already failed. And, and the notion that a Ukraine that then has its territory back, that then is on a path to, let's say, in, 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 a, in an ideal way, um, to economic prosperity and the world investing to assist with their reconstruction and potentially a pathway within the EU and, and within NATO, I think that that, that then makes the dilemma uh, even more difficult for Russia. Um, whether or not they, they, they dismiss the strategic goal, I don't know. But in a way, it, it almost doesn't matter because it's unachievable. And then in Africa, I think you're right. I think what we're seeing, I'm wary of those eight or nine coups that we've seen since 2020 and that we draw a line between all of them and somehow they're homogenous. I think, I think we've, got to, we've, got to, we've got to avoid that European trap of, of big hand, small man. Um, but I think we've got to acknowledge that there's a competition going on. And I think that, I don't know, uh, apologies, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with your uh, defence policy, but I think when I look at uh, the UK, that adjustment from maybe a decade or so ago where there was a, a real focus on counter-terrorism to now an acknowledgement that we're in great state competition and back to the campaigning piece, that is, that is almost geographically agnostic. It's something that's going on all over the world. Uh, and, and that's what I think is happening. Patrick, last question. Patrick Cronin, Admiral, thank you very much for this great discussion. But I wanted to ask you about technology, and in particular, autonomous drone warfare. So the small, the smart, the cheap, the mini. Will this work? Will it deter? Are you confident? Uh, yes, well, well it, it is working. Um, 
it will, it, again, it's another example of morphing and adjusting. And you're seeing a competition. And you're seeing cheap drones going up and being shot down by expensive missiles. Um, you're seeing decoys going up um, to, to, again, to, 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 to take out expensive missiles. And you're, I think all of us are acknowledging this, this, this extraordinary, uh, ubiquitous nature of drone warfare. And therefore, it's, 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 it's here, and it's here to stay. And I think the piece that is, I think the peak back to this industrial issue, I think the piece to me that we're struggling with is, is, the, is the agility that you need um, in order to be able to produce drones very quickly, but also to adjust to, to some of the, the tactics on the battlefield. And Ukraine, I think, has been incredibly successful at that. We're learning a lot from the way that they do that. I think Russia is, 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 is learning a lot as well, as is Iran. Um, so it's, it's, it's here to stay. But again, we should be confident of this partnership of nations and then what that gives you. The, the extraordinary industrial base that we have by, by dint of, 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 of Western and I, you know, the, 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 the capitalist uh, system and what that offers. And therefore, they, you, know, you can stimulate innovation and you can respond really quickly. Um, but we might have to, we might have to kick uh, some of our, when I look at our you know, UK defense, um, it, it needs a jolt in order to come off some of the, the really big monolithic programs to get into this faster spiral development uh, and, and cheap and cheerful uh, and to get those onto the battlefield much more quickly. Well, um, Admiral, thank you so much for being here. I'm confident that the U.S.-U.K. alliance is critical as we move into this great power competition um, for the years and years to come. And so we are so super thankful for all the work that you've done, the time that you spent here with us. And please join me in thanking Admiral Rodkin. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca.